Welcome everybody to the first panel organized by the Darendorf Forum with the wonderful title The Great Questions of Our Time and the Future of the Liberal Order. Um, the Darendorf Forum is a joint initiative by the Hertie School in Berlin and the London School of Economics and Political Science and it is funded by Stiftung Mercator. My name is Philipp Feigler, I am an editor at Zeit Online in Berlin and I'm one of the founders of Deutschland spricht and My Country Talks, an international platform that brings together people with completely different viewpoints. So the question that we're going to discuss today is indeed the great question of our time. How can democracy cope with polarization? I guess all of us saw the pictures from the streets in Berlin last weekend, around 30,000 people, a small but very loud and aggressive group attended a coronavirus skeptic demo. It was a somehow weird group of self-proclaimed lateral thinkers, esoterics and right-wing extremists. And although this group was a weird mix of people, there seemed to be at least some viewpoints that most of them agree on. Skepticism against the so-called elites, the mainstream media, and a fundamental mistrust against the main institutions of our society. So I think here we have some aspects that relate to the problem of polarization. This group sees the world through a totally different lens than, lens than for example, we do. And that is one of the reasons why it is so hard to talk and discuss with them. And these are ingredients or at least warning signs for polarization. So the mistrust and hatred against other parties or groups of society reminds us of a situation we are witnessing in other countries in way bigger dimension, for example, in the US where effective and emotional polarization is at an all time high. In Germany, I think the picture is a bit different and I hope we can discuss that today. I think there are several questions that are crucial in that context. So what are the reasons for polarization? And not only in the German case, how can we measure and describe polarization and the problems behind that phenomenon? Is polarization always a bad thing? Or in other words, what's wrong with polarization? And of course, the biggest question, if polarization is a problem, how can we cope with it? I'm happy now to introduce the three wonderful panelists today. First, I'm very happy to welcome Leah Uppi. She's a professor uh, in political theory in the government department at the London School of Economics. And she's also a professor in philosophy at the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University. She has worked extensively on topics of global justice. And she will speak today about the question, what is wrong with polarization? A very warm welcome. I'm also happy to introduce Andrea Römmele. She is the Dean of Executive Education and Professor of Communication and Politics and Civil Society here at the Hertie School in Berlin. She recently published a book on discussions among political opponents, claiming that we need a new debate culture in Germany. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Philip. And third, I'm happy to welcome Rudolf Stichwe. He's the director of the Forum Internationale Wissenschaft and holds the Professorship Theory of Modern Society at the University of Bonn. He is currently working on a book with the title Theorie der Weltgesellschaft, Theory of a World Society, and is a renowned researcher on democracy. A warm welcome to all of you. So in the beginning, I would like to ask all three panelists to give a short input on our topic. Uh, Andrea, may you start? The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Philip. Uh, and I'm really um, uh, delighted to be in this very distinguished group to discuss these uh, questions uh, today with you. I mean, um, sort of the task I was given is that I should give a very brief uh, introduction on right-wing populism and post-corona times whenever or whatever post-corona, uh, uh, you know, whenever post-corona uh, is. And I'll um, start off with uh, discussing the situation in, in Germany and then 
um, also looking a bit into the international context and I'll try to keep it uh, really short. Let me recapture, before we talk about, you know, post-corona times, let me uh, go back to pre-corona times and recapture what actually happened last year uh, uh, in Germany. Um, as uh, all of you know, the AFD did, did extremely well uh, in Germany uh, last year in the fall in the three uh, quite prominent state elections we had in uh, East uh, Germany. Uh, in all instances, they came out as the second largest fraction actually challenging uh, the uh, incumbents to a quite significant uh, degree. And the incumbents all did well, but during the campaigns, there were, um, I mean, I remember uh, some surveys that actually showed uh, the uh, AFD um, actually, you know, really being in a tie with then the uh, winning party. Uh, second point, due to their success in the eastern part of the country, the AFD moved even more uh, towards the right because that part of the AFD became more prominent uh, within uh, the party. And at the beginning, when Corona hit, the AFD, AFD still was quite successful in keeping their support by continuing their anti-establishment course. Now, so far, the recapturing. Now, what is challenging them? What is challenging the far uh, right at the moment? Uh, the management of the uh, corona crisis by the government in Germany is getting a record high approval. Um, I looked into the, you know, in preparation of our discussion today, I looked into the numbers uh, yesterday, and over 80% of the German population are not only satisfied with the measures that are taken towards corona, um, some of them actually even would like to have uh, more restrictions, first point. The second challenge, of course, is uh, the internal fights the AFD have. And third point, uh, their core issue, uh, migration, is not an issue anymore in the broader public. It's not of relevance at the moment. Um, at the moment, uh, the issues that are debated, of course, are uh, corona, education being a very prominent issue, digitalization. And I think when we move more towards uh, uh, post-corona uh, uh, issues of the labor market and so on will become more prominent. And those are issues that are not at the heart of the populace of the AFD. Now, internationally... Uh, the sort of international leading populists, if I may call them like that, quote unquote, Trump, Putin and Bolsonaro have all failed in uh, managing the crisis uh, so far. Uh, I wouldn't say it's, uh, 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 it, it's hurting them. At the moment, it's not more. Let's talk again uh, at the beginning of November after the US election uh, to see how uh, that has played out in the US. Now, um, what are they trying to do? Um, as far as I see that, at least in Germany, uh, uh, they want to make use and profit from the corona protests. That's also something the AFD did a couple of years ago with uh, Pegida. Uh, but the big difference to Pegida is that uh, those protests are even more radicalized, uh, extremely radicalized, and that would push the party even further towards the right. And that might be even too right for uh, uh, the AFD. So just to sum that up and then also link it to the discussion we have uh, here in the panel where we talk about uh, polarization. I mean, the big question for, for post-corona times is will we manage to sort of uh, move closer together as a society and have less polarization or will we in the long run due to um, the economic development to more people being unemployed and so on actually have a growing uh, polarization and if that is the trend I would say that uh, uh, populists in general the AFD in Germany in particular will probably gain momentum again. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Andrea. Um, Lea, may I ask you for your input, please? Yeah. So um, anxiety is, first of all, thank you very much for having me in the panel. I want to raise some more skeptical questions about the concept of polarization. It seems to me that anxieties about polarization speak to the kind of basic political question of how far conflict undermines democratic order. And one of the concerns is that politics would run better if strong opinions could be tempered. Mm -hmm. I think one needs to be cautious with the concept of polarization because I think there is a kind of implicit normative theory here that needs to be assessed on its own terms. Um, diagnosis of polarization generally carry the implication that political conflicts ought to be minimized and suggest that politics should be oriented to the center, whatever the center might mean in practice. So the idea is that a good polity is a consensual policy, polity, and that divisions are dangerous because they threaten the common good. I think these ideas need scrutiny, especially when they move out of the ivory tower and they come into how we think about politics as citizens, because these narratives tend not to scrutinize too hard the substance of politics at the center. So for people who speak of the dangers of polarization, often the desirability of the center tends to be assumed. But my concern is that talk about polarization generally says very little about the content of disagreement or the reasons that trigger it. It seems to imply that one form of disagreement is analogous to another and that it removes the possibility that sometimes the poles or one of the poles may deserve trenchant opposition, but the other might require relentless defense. So what I wanted to raise today is whether the concept of polarization, which comes with a kind of underlying normative ideal, uh, which we may characterize as moderation, is always a virtue. So is moderation always a virtue? To, mo to what extent is it a virtue? And what reasons might we have to be skeptical of moderation? What might make it a du dubious virtue? And I think uh, I'm not saying that moderation doesn't have its place. It's more to ask whether moderation genuinely deserves to be celebrated as a kind of foundational virtue of politics and whether the absence of moderation as observed in the kind of contemporary diagnosis of polarization is necessarily a pathological development. So it seems to me that the value of moderation depends very much on the nature of the society to which it is applied. So if a society is a fundamentally just society or a nearly just society, then of course moderation may be an appropriate ideal to the extent that everyone is committed to it. But things look very different if the status quo is itself corrupted and in need of far reaching change. And if there is one thing that we have seen in the last few months is precisely the challenge to the status quo and the risks and the dangers that it brings with it. And my concern is that moderation as the virtue that stands behind polarization or behind the concerns with polarization is unlikely to offer the challenge that is required and that sometimes might in fact obstruct it. So I think what many lament as polarization could be the symptom of a change that is resisted and separation that uh, an evaluation that can be separated from the evaluation of the current changes at stake. So while I think not every context of sharp division features a kind of progressive force, every political context in which such a force appears is likely to become a polarized context. Uh, the other concern with polarization is that uh, radical political change tends to often depend on the action of groups and moderation is an outlook that is generally at odds with their political participation. In fact, it's often intended to kind of forestall it. And so those who extol the virtue of moderation tend to cast it as something that is exercised by individuals. So political representatives, technical appointees, judges, individual citizens can exercise moderation. And institutions and legal structures are also valued insofar as they encourage this disposition in individuals. But uh, institutional arrangements designed to encourage moderation tend to limit the power of groups or to preempt their formation. So think about structures of divided power established by the US Constitution, which were conceived by the Federalists talking about the ills of faction. So while all this might be an attractive feature in a nearly just society, it's clearly problematic when a transformative politics is required because programs of change and the agency needed to execute these changes are likely to depend on the presence of collectives and radical politics is often a politics of groups valued for the ideas that they stand for. Whereas on the other hand, moderate politics, I think tends to be more a politics of individuals which are valued for their personal 
qualities, including uh, moderation. So the key question, uh, as I see it, is that uh, we shouldn't try and exclude groups and radical politics from uh, the area of um, policy making, of activism, of engagement, by talking about the dangers of polarization. The key question, I think, is what kind of institution can enable conflicts and uh, collectives of the right kind to take shape so that they can be productive for uh, the wider political community and so that they can channel political conflict in the right way by internalizing these values of democratic and deliberative decision making. So I think the concern is not so much to fight polarization by applauding moderation, but to be more active in constructing the right forms of political participation that enable political conflict to be channeled in the right way. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This was very interesting. Thank you. I think there's a lot of uh, thoughts for the debate later. Um, Professor Stichwe, may you give your introduction, please? Yeah, I, I want to start with a few remarks on polarization. And I want to start with a formula which has been created by an American sociologist, Benjamin Nelson, which I find very, very apt for understanding the present situation. The, it's a book written a number of decades ago, and in, in its title, you already have the thesis. It's from tribal brotherhood to universal otherhood. And that I find a very good formula. That means humanity has lived most of the time it existed on Earth in a situation of tribal brotherhood. There were tribes. Members of tribes knew one another, they were brothers towards one another, and all others were strangers and enemies. And that was a dominant situation of humanity for 10,000s of years. And from this arose what Benjamin Nelson called universal otherhood. And that I find a very good formula. That means, and I think that is what liberal order is about, universal otherhood means everybody is different, everybody is an individual, and from the interaction of uh, individuals and their differences, orders and liberal orders arise. And if one starts with this understanding, one can easily create a, a, an idea of tribalization, of polarization and its problems. Polarization on the basis of this understanding is a re-tribalization of politics and society. You have no longer universal otherhood, you have no longer a liberal order, but you have a social and political order which consists from tribes. Tribes who again look at one another as enemies. And if you have tribalization, and I think that's the situation in which we live in many countries in the world, if you have tribalization, you have two alternatives. There can be many tribes, that is somehow unproblematic. Many tribes means not a liberal order, but means you have what has often been call, called a multicultural democracy. They consist from many tribes. The Netherlands are a good example. It consists and consisted for, for a long time from tribes, but there were many tribes. And on the basis of this interaction of many tribes arose a, not a liberal order, but a democratic order. But problems arise when there are no longer many tribes, but two tribes. Two tribes who have wholly negative understandings from one another, who are related towards one another by what has been called negative partisanship, and two tribes who are related towards one another via enmity and via defining themselves via identities. Tribes are no longer defined by the issues on which they have different opinions, but they are defined by different divergent identities which are related towards one another by enmities. And that's what we observe in many countries in the world. If you look at the Trump situation, the election by which Trump came into office, or if you look at the Brexit uh, process and the Brexit decisions, these are two political and social situations of our days, which were clearly brought about by a society falling into two tribes and these two tribes fighting with one another. And that's 
that's the situation and that's the problem. I think, you, of course, you have to understand, and that's perhaps our most important question, how could this happen? How could this retribalization of politics and society uh, somehow endanger and perhaps even destroy the liberal order? Why, why did it happen? And that's perhaps the most important question. I won't uh, go into it. We can go into it in, into, in the discussion. But from my understanding, there are two core problems. The one is related somehow to higher education and science. Modern countries, modern societies are very much, much split by a split between those who have higher education and those who have no higher education. That's a very prominent split nearly everywhere, at least in the OECD world. Therefore, that's one central point. And the other central point, in my understanding, is migration. Migration is, is a very prominent phenomenon, a very prominent problem everywhere, clearly related to Trump, clearly related to the Brexit decision. And migration implies, again, the problem that by liberals, it's seen as an enrichment of universal otherhood. And by non-liberal, it's seen as the coming of new dangerous tribes. And that's the reason migration is so prominent. And I think that are the two problems which you have to understand and perhaps somehow to work on if you want to change polarization of politics and society. Thanks a lot. That was also very interesting. And I think we have already a disagreement here, I would say. And um, so maybe we start with the discussion. And I think what, what, is, what would be really helpful is to, to have a, a common understanding of what we, what we mean when we talk about polarization here. Because, I mean, like, as Professor Stichbe said, he said, it's a retribalization. I'm not sure if... Um, there, Professor Ippi, if Ippi, would you agree with that, with that position or with this definition of, uh, of um, polarization? And because I see there's a, there a disagreement between you two, maybe you would like to answer. Um, I, I think it depends on whether the see the we see the question. And so I, I was trying to distinguish between the kind of empirical understanding of what polarization is and what we see, how we observe it and so on. In which case, I wouldn't disagree that polarization is often captured as the emergence of group identities that stand in conflict with each other and that reveal a degree of intolerance for each other. My concern is that paying too much attention to the way in which these groups are empirically manifested and to focus just on that empirical manifestation doesn't enable us to then question in the abstract, is polarization the right way to be concerned about these conflicts? Or should we not instead talk about what is it that they are concerned about? What are the substantive questions that animate us? I think Andrea started, for example, with the IFT. And we often, when we talk about polarization, we often have in mind at least liberal progressives, right-wing populists or far-right groups and so on. But then sometimes from the right, the concept is used to characterize left-wing activists, so Black Lives Matter and so on. And my concern is that the generic term of polarization used to capture both these instances doesn't enable us to talk about the different reasons that they might have for manifesting, for being concerned about what happens to them and so on. And that I think it would be more useful for us to talk about what are the concerns and to have ways in which we can then have a discussion in the public sphere about are these concerns reasonable? Are they equally reasonable? Are some of these concerns ones that we can incorporate into public debate or others that we can say, look, we need to revisit the foundations here and to, um, or should we take these manifestations at five space value? But my worry is that if we do that, then we are unable to see then the distinctive concerns of these groups. Mm. Professor Stichwe, I think your position is slightly different and you would say that the problem is deeper than... Yeah, I would, I would agree. Uh, and immediately to to your point, I would say I would say like to say I of course you are entirely right. What we would prefer and would like to have, and perhaps that is what is a liberal order implies, we would prefer to have a situation in everybody listens to the points the other one makes. But that's as much as I see it, not polarization. 
terrorization is a situation in which nobody is willing to listen to the points the other one makes. And that's what we observe. If you look at the Republicans and Democrats in the United States, and that's an extremely polarized situation today, which it never was in the decades before, is a situation in which on both sides there is no interest in the arguments of the other side. The only thing they do is cultivating their extremely negative uh, ideas about the other one. And that's what I, and that's, of course, that's not, that's polarization and that's extremely problematic for democracy. Andrea, I see you're heavily nodding, so... Yeah, heavily so, nodding, so. and, and, and um, I want to raise a, uh, a uh, couple of points. Um, the first point is, um, of course, you know, democracy is about polarization to some extent. And uh, I mean, democracy is about different ideas, different uh, visions and so on being debated and being discussed. And uh, relating to that to your opening remarks, Philip, uh, I mean, uh, you, you did say yes, polarization is increasing. Um, and, and the big question we have to ask ourselves, if we see the role polarization has in democracies, you know, is there something like a, a line we are crossing now and, and which we should not cross? My first point. My second point, Rudolf, that relates to uh, what you uh, elaborated uh, uh, on. You... Um, I fully agree with uh, what you say, and um, uh, thanks a lot for the reference to the uh, readings, which I was not aware of, of Benjamin Nelson, but I'll definitely uh, take a look at that. I very much uh, 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 yeah, would like to have a closer look at the arguments. But you mentioned uh, the US and the UK. Uh, you know, being at the forefront now when it comes to polar polarization. Well, yeah, no big surprise because institutionally with the way the electoral system uh, in both countries is made up, it of course invites polarization way more than we with our consensual democracy, with our proportional representation electoral uh, uh, systems have. And I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit more when... I mean, the uh, electoral system we have in the UK and the US, by the way, was a system we actually discussed in the German public in the 70s and 80s as a kind of role model, right? Uh, there was a huge discussion in Germany uh, about this. But um, can you perhaps elaborate a little bit on why, when and why this has changed? My, I mean, my reading of this is it actually started to polarize more and then go off the deep end with Newt Gingrich in the 90s. Yeah, it's, if you take, for example, the United States, if you go back, say, 50 to 70 years, and you had the same parties you have today, but Democrats and Republicans, and mostly no, never a third party. There was yeah. a few periods, but long time ago. And when you look in the 50s and 60s, you have in both parties an extremely co complex spectrum from the liberal left to very far right. In, in uh, the the 50s and the 60s, mostly you could not, not identify a Democrat or a Republican by his or her opinions. They, all opinions were presented in both parties. And that is a completely non-polarized situation. And of course, there was an enormous, I would distinguish, and I think that's important. You had an enormous diversity of opinions all this, the whole diversity of this opinion was represented in both parties. And uh, all this has completely changed. Today, you have uh, two ideological camps which are completely different from one another. When you know this person is a Democrat, this person is, is a Republican, you can tell without knowing him personally or her personally, all of his or her opinions, because they are 
completely convergent in all their opinions. There are, they, they, if you are a Republican, you are against, you think climate change doesn't happen. If you are a Democrat or it is not relevant, if a Democrat, you think it's a very, and so on, over all the topics you can complete. And that's the new situation which arose over 50 to 70 years. And of course, the most important, right? and I think Britain is, is more complicated, but at least in the Brexit decision, Britain is not in the same way polarized than the United States because, for example, it has a more complex party system. Mm. But in the Brexit de de decision and in the Brexit process, a polarization arose again two half of the two halves of the British population, which which completely separated from one another, which can no longer speak with one another, and which define one the, the other one as enemy in, in many respects. And of course, the major question is why did this happen in the United States, in England, and in many, not in all, I think Germany is not at all polarized. We have it completely, it's, it's, it, it compared to these cases, we have no polarization in Germany, but completely different situation. Mm -hmm. This why question is important. I said it at the beginning, I think you have to analyze the role of higher education in modern societies, and you have to analyze migration. There are other points, but from my point of view, in, in both countries, Britain and the US, and in some respects in Germany, to higher education mm -hmm. and migration are very decisive developments which bring about social, cultural, and in other respects, political polarization. So I would like to talk with you about the German situation later and also about the differences between Germany, the UK and the US, because I think we have totally different situations here. But first of all, I want to quote um, um, from a book from Ezra Klein. I don't know if some of you have read it. It's called Why We Are Polarized. Uh, it's, it's a new book from the founder of Vox in the US. And in his book, he quotes some Stanford researchers by saying the following about the US. The old theory was that political parties came into existence to represent deep social cleavages. But now party politics has taken a life on its own. Not now, it is the cleavage itself. And I think this is something that uh, Rudolf Stichwey has in mind when he talks about the US. The party system itself is the cleavage now. Mm -hmm. So, um, Lea, um, do, you, I mean, like, do you see a problem there? when you look at the US, the situation in the US, especially in the US, when you see this, this, this uh, tendencies of tribalism, or do you still think also in the US, we overestimate the problem of polarization? Um, my concern is not so much that we overestimate it, but that we psychologize the dangers, that we tend to depoliticize the concerns that polarization speaks to when we talk about the attitudes of the people who are polarized and their way of expressing their anger or their resentment. So my concern is that there is a tendency to assume that liberal institutions are fine, that democracy works, and then there's these fanatics that emerge everywhere that for reasons that we don't understand that seem somehow to be on the sort of surface unrelated to the way in which we have created institutions, to the way in which our democracy works, to the party system itself and so on. So my worry is that the category of polarization doesn't help us address the, the deeper problems. And my, my suspicion is that the deeper problems have to do with liberalism, that there is a kind of crisis of liberalism that manifests itself in various layers and the economic layer and political layer and a social level as well. And so that it's that crisis of liberalism, uh, which comes to some extent with the decline of sort of old social democracy, which can be observed in a number of European countries, but also outside Europe. And that the, the polarization is a symptom, but doesn't seem to me to be a cause. And that my concern is that if we focus on criticizing polarization and talking about the dangers of polarization, talking about the psychological attitudes of those who are in conflict with each other, we don't uh, dig deeper and we don't look into the structural reasons for why polarization emerges. 
So, and, and that can apply to, uh, to a number of areas. I mean, we can talk about party politics, but there's many different ways of talking about parties. At an empirical level, one concern with parties is that they are, uh, at the moment, especially in the US, they're not so much parties in the kind of ideal sense of the term of communities of principle that bring together collectives that care about certain uh, public goods, that care about certain ways of articulating how we understand these public goods, but that parties are factions and they just represent particular political interests. I think it's a very important distinction, the distinction between a party and a faction. A party is supposed to overcome the faction. A party is something that is supposed to promote certain public goods, but the party that is reduced to being a faction ends up just replicating the problem and doesn't serve the institutional purposes that the parties were created to serve. So I think what we should do is think more about what parties represent at their best and think about how far the party system that we have has departed from this more desirable way of understanding what parties are. And my concern is polarization because it kind of brings these two things, it merges them, collapses them together, doesn't enable us to do that. Um, I have one, yeah, Andrea, you want to answer? Yeah, I just want to add uh, to uh, what Leah said. I fully support uh, uh, that argument. Now, from a party's perspective or from a party, uh, a party scholar's perspective, we have arrived at uh, what party researchers call cartel parties. And that also relates to the argument you have uh, just put forward, where the party system as such is uh, a cleavage. And that really leads to detachment of the people. The big question about, you know, representation and that where that's to some extent where the the, the anti-establishment uh, uh, notion uh, uh, or argument uh, uh, comes from and if there is one good thing at the moment about uh, the corona crisis in Germany is that the respect of politicians uh, the, the, the the trust towards uh, politicians and the political system is rising uh, uh, again. But what we have seen over the last couple of years, especially in the US, but also in other uh, countries, is that uh, that uh, uh, people don't want to, you know, want to work for politics in general anymore. Uh, they don't want to go into uh, public service. They They don't want to work for a party and so on. I have two questions from the audience. One is for uh, Leah Uppi. The question is the following. You refer to like the virtues of polarization and to internalizing deliberation, which sounds attractive, but how can one deliberate with positions which are based on, for example, conspiracy theories like Canaan, we saw it on the streets last weekend. And uh, for, how can we deal with people who demand that I know the, 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 the government should resign without giving a reason, for example. Uh, and uh, the question is from Andreas Busch, and he, he says, for him, it seems like there seems to lack a common basis for that kind of deliberation. What do you think about that? Shall I start? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so my concern is with uh, our understanding of polarization as a kind of departure from the center. And I think the question raised actually speaks to that point because when conspiracy theories become mainstream, when fake news become mainstream and so on, that is the center. And what we need in those cases is not to be moderate towards the center. What we need is to actually argue against it. And so my, uh, my argument would be precisely that in those cases when you know the uh, adversary seems unreasonable or when it's based on conspiracy theories or fake news and so on, it's the particular position that we need to criticize. We shouldn't say, oh, the problem is that they are polarized. No, the problem is that they have conspiracy theories that are based on unreliable data that don't trust science, that don't trust reason. So that is a completely different line of critique from the one that laments the dangers of polarization more generally, which then applies across the spectrum, assuming that there is a center that holds at all times and places, regardless of what happens in politics, because the center moves. And with the center, our attitude to it should also change depending on the content of the message that the um, center is channeling. And my concern is that when we talk about the danger of polarization in general, we just assume that there is a center that holds and we don't dispute the substance of the positions around it or uh, that scrutinize it. Does everybody agree or is there disagreement in the group? Yeah, perhaps I would like to make one point. I think we have 
in as as much as as I understand it, we have to distinguish two two points. As much as I understand Leah, she doesn't really argue for polarization. But as I understand you, you argue for radical opinions and for a place in the political discourse for any political positions and especially for radical positions. And I would completely agree with this, but that is not what I understand as polarizations. Polarization, I would propose to understand as a situation in which there are only two positions and all other positions between these two extreme positions disappear. That is what polarization is about. And I still would propose that's really problematic. If you have only two positions and both positions radicalize incessantly and ever more increase their ne negative de definition and negative understanding of the other one, then discussion ends and there is no discourse and debate and fruitful understanding of the position of the other one happens. And that's what I understand as polarization. I, and I think that's real problematic. Of course, you are entirely right to prefer a situation in which there are many positions and even very radical positions, and you can argue about it. But that is diversity or pluralism and not polarization. Um, there's a question from Michael Meyer Resende from the audience. Um, he's, he asks, could we say polarization is a problem once one or both poles of the spectrum start disregarding the democratic rules of the game? For example, by saying the other side is so bad, we have to stop them, whatever it takes. Would you agree on that definition? I, I'm not quite sure if I understand this correctly, but I would uh, affirm one point. Perhaps it agrees with what, what was asked. I think the risk of polarization for democracy precisely consists if you really have a polarized situation and if you really have a completely negative definition of the other one, then you come in a position in which you can't imagine that you have to leave power again. And that's exactly the point at which a polarized uh, political situation is endangered by a transition to an autocratic system. And that can happen at any time. It has often, often happened. And you only, uh, it probably, and I hope won't happen in the United States, but there are many indicators that, for example, the present Trump administration, and especially Donald Trump himself, won't imagine that he could have to leave power. And probably and perhaps he will have to leave power. But for example, he will never accept, uh, 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 if, if he should lose the election, he, would, he will also always claim it was a fake election and so on. And that is a situation where polarization is endangered by a transition to an autocratic regime. And that's in many respects, that's the biggest problem. And it has happened dozens of times and it will happen again and again. And we have to think about it now. I have a question in mind when I looked at the, 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 the demonstrations last weekend. Would you recommend to include these people in a public discussion? And if yes, how? Um. I, so can I, maybe I can start? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I would say that the, the, the way these manifestations take the form they take is because they are symptomatic of exclusion. And I would say that when the party system works in the way in which it should work, those exclusions are tempered at the margin because they, the, the, the sort of the groups that take to the streets, that take to protest and that reject institutions become through the party system institutionalized and become responsible in some ways for the kinds of political goods that they promote. My concern is that we are at a point in, our, in the development of our political institutions, in the development of liberalism, in the development in sort of from a political economic perspective in which the groups and the, the individuals 
the grievances of which are captured by these groups feel excluded by the institutions. And the reasons they have to feel included by the institutions are plausible reasons. They're not, you know, they're not unreasonable. They're, these are not crazy people. They're not psychologically deficient or anything like that. I think there are plausible grievances. It was the same thing with Brexit. And if we kind of assume that every group, every person who manifests in a group like that is somehow unreasonable or is psychologically disturbed and so on, then we're not really engaging with the reasons that they have. So mm -hmm. this is what, uh, um, so I would say that it's, it's imperative to include these groups in the political community, but it's also imperative to create the kind of political economic conditions under which groups can feel uh, respected and included. It's no point just giving people a, a share at the table and then lo not listening to them. So I think there is a, uh, how one does it is what the challenge is then. Andrea. Yeah, I, I, I agree to some extent that I also wouldn't exclude uh, uh, these uh, these groups. But sort of the big question is, how do you actually uh, moderate democratic discourse? And I have always been a very strong believer that democratic discourse actually is best if there are no rules, right? Uh, I always said the only rule I, I, I would put out is no personal attacks, right? But I've been rethinking that. Um, and uh, sort of one addition, I think, I, I, I mean, you mentioned my book, Philip. I think one addition I would put into my, uh, 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 into my book now is uh, I would add to to no personal attacks, I would add the discussion has to be based on facts. I would not discuss uh, with someone who uh, like doesn't respect the facts. And that's sort of the question I, I think that's out there now. Um, <coughs> excuse me. How do we moderate this democratic discourse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there disagreement? I mean, like... Um... The other question would be, where are, like you mentioned two limits of this political discourse, like no personal attacks and like a, a discussion that is based on facts. Are there other limits? And should we limit the political discourse? Do we want like conspiracy theories being part of our political, this everyday political discussion? Or, or do we have to I know, defend uh, a, a system or a discussion that is rational against these kind of tendencies. Uh, yeah. Professor Stichwe. Yeah. I think what the democracy is about uh, that you can say everything. Every opinion, every worldview, every political proposal is allowed. And democracy is a very liberal, is the most liberal political system which ever existed in history. And I could strongly affirm this, and in this respect, of course, you have to say, uh, for example, if you think of the Corona crisis, of course, to be every position which is uh, for, for which someone protests or argues is part of the political discourse. But uh, in another respect, you have to say uh, one, one other thing. Uh, we, we are in Germany in some respects. We are not really in Germany, but in the Zoom space, but in other respects, we speak about Germany too. And there, one reservation probably has to be made. Germany said we accept any position, but we have a specific history and we don't accept anti-Semitism and national socialism. And of course, if you think about last weekend, uh, there were very diverse tendencies, but national socialism and anti-Semitism was a very big part of it, of the events on Saturday and Sunday. And that is something about which Germany always has said we have a specific history, we have a responsibility towards our history, and we won't accept anti-Semitism and national socialism. And it was a big part, and it was very serious what happened on Saturday and Sunday, and we have to think about it. 
I um, don't speak about resistance toward vaccines and resistance toward biomedicine. Of course, that that that's in, that was also in Germany. That was already prominent. It was to be seen on Saturday and Sunday too, and that's a completely different story. So I think now we are in the middle of the German debate because I think we have to like um, we have to think differently about the US and about Germany, for example. So when we talk about polarization, we attempted to analyze the situation in Germany against the blueprint of the developments in the US, but obviously there are differences. Maybe we go a bit deeper in, in that question. What, how do you view these differences between Germany and the rest of the world when we talk about polarization? A point I already made uh, earlier is that um, our political system, our institutions, our electoral system is constructed in a way that um, is very consensus oriented. Um, and I think that's at least, at least part of the, I'm not saying that's the overall success story, but that's part of the uh, success story. And I think in the US um, it would, um, it would lead to a completely, we would have a completely different, less polarized debate if we had a proportional, uh, uh, if we had proportional representation and hence through proportional representation, of course, would also have more political parties than just two. But I think if I understood uh, Leah right, one argument can be, there was too much consensus. And now we have a, um, a fraction of people who feel excluded from uh, the debate or from, from the, the political sphere. And that is one reason why parties like the AfD, one explanation. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the typical, I, I wouldn't, I, I would still say that's a kind of typical cycle you have if you have these, you know, long phases of a super grand coalition we had over the last couple of years combined with a super consensus oriented way of leading the country um, uh, uh, like Angela uh, Merkel did. And in, in phases of, of, of grand coalitions, it is normal that the centers uh, that periphery uh, uh, actually gain in uh, uh, in momentum but, but I, I, I would I mean you already mentioned that Philip, we have a completely different different situation in Germany than we have uh, for example in the US and to some extent also in the uh, in the UK and I do want to stress the institutional uh, 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 angle here quite a bit mm -hmm. or the so systemic my, angle so maybe for the last 10 minutes, um, my question would be, if we say polarization is a problem, and I think at least Andrea and uh, uh, Mr. Stichway, you are both on this, on this side, how can we cope with this? What, what can we do now? Uh, how can we deal with this problem? And uh, maybe Leah, you can, you can add what you think, like how can we, deal with the problem that you described, like this feeling of exclusion. Um, so maybe can you, maybe, uh, Mr. Stiffley, do you want to start? Of course you have, there are two dimensions which you have to distinguish, I suppose. One is the phenomenology of um, polarization how this, if this is the right description, how does this retribalization of society and politics come about and how does it look like and how does it endanger debate and deliberation? That's one side and that's the side on which we mostly, which we discuss most of the time today. In some respects, the more important question is what is behind it? What are the societal causes? And if you want to, if you perceive polarization of, as a problem, and I tend to perceive it as a problem, indeed, you have to identify the causes and then you have to work upon them. And, and in doing this, you, of course, you have to look at individual countries. For example, if you look at Germany, I would say 
what very much changed Germany in the last few years was a migration crisis of 2015. That was a, for us, that was a very momentous event that has very much changed Germany and that today we have again a strong party on the radical right, the, the AfD, it was caused by the migration crisis. Before it was a completely different party, it, it was a very, uh, uh, it was a little a strange party with strange opinions on the Euro and the, the European Union, but now it's an anti-migration party, made mostly, and a, an anti-foreigner party, and that makes it problematic and radical and changes the German situation. And if you want to work on this, you have to work on migration policy. That's obvious. And this still is one of the most, that, that perhaps, in, in the moment, it's not so much in the foreground because we have this corona crisis, of course, but it still will, for the coming years, that, that's a key question for German politics. That's obvious. We have still significant migration. We still have millions of migrants who perhaps are not so well integrated as we should perhaps have tried to integrate them and significant political problems come from this and we have to we need a, an, an intelligent uh, migration policy with a number of instruments and we have to work about it and that, that so much what regards polarization in Germany? In Germany, it's not so much a big problem, but that is a problem. For the US, it's much more complicated, much more complicated, and for other countries too, yeah. Uh, Leah, I guess that you would agree to the point that um, we should work on the problems, not on the polarization itself, right? Uh, yeah, I guess I would uh, maybe disagree with what I see as what I diagnose as a problem and would suggest um, a couple of solutions, some more long term than others. Uh, as I say, as I see the, the current crisis and the previous crisis as well, and a number of the recent crises are symptomatic of the crisis of liberalism and of capitalism more generally. So my overall overarching solution would be that we need to find a way of leaving capitalism and constructing a better, more humane, more respectful alternative. But since that is a very long-term solution and it requires also a lot of political mobilization and political effort, if I were to give more minimal prescriptions, I would say there's two uh, aspects that were both actually raised in our discussion that are crucial. One is education, access to education and the kind of reduction of uh, bridging the gaps in these education levels and the whole education system, the way in which it's privatized. I mean, we talked about the difference between the United Kingdom and Germany, but I would say, of course, both are liberal countries and of course, liberalism is in crisis in both of them. But the reason I see the United Kingdom is in a much deeper, much more problematic situation is that I think access to education is much more restricted and much more uh, to the advantage of particular classes than it is in Germany. So social mobility is much lower in the United Kingdom than it is in Germany. And I think that affects the kind of quality of institutions and the quality of democratic decision uh, making. The other concern I have is that we should stop instrumentalizing cultural conflicts. And that has to do with the other thing that Andrea mentioned, which is information. So we need to argue based on facts and information. But we also need to think about where does information come from? Who owns the media? How are arguments in the media presented and how are they shaped and framed in such a way that conflicts that I think are not conflicts at all become conflicts. I mean, I come from the Balkans, so I'm extremely sensitive and get extremely agitated when this comes up because I see the Balkans as historically the paradigmatic context in which artificial divisions become explosive in the way in which they are framed and instrumentalized throughout history. So there's these cultures that are extremely close to each other where these people get on very well, they intermarry, they go on together for years and years and years. And then suddenly the media starts agitating the specter of cultural nationalism or cultural divisions or sort of mobility and so on, migration and so on. And then they become explosive. So I think when we think about, okay, we need to think about information, the quality of information, the quality of media, we also have to think about how news get man manipulated and, and instrumentalized and how things like, for example, 
the cultural conflicts that migration brings become an issue where they would be a non-issue if the media weren't blowing them in the way in which they do. Just a minor addition to the education uh, argument, uh, which I uh, uh, also see, or which I fully uh, support. If we talk about education nowadays, you know, this also means educating the young people in media literacy, democracy, uh, and so on, not, not feeding. I mean, if I look at my teenage kids, you know, they get all this data stuff in school and an additional uh, um, uh, statistics lecture and so on. Media literacy, uh, democracy are, are um, fields that really should also be invested in. So um, maybe we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Um, here's one from uh, Okello Obong Felix. He asks, it's a question for Lea. He asks, so he would like to hear how uneven allocation and distribution of national resources is related to a situation that we describe as polarization. Well, so one way in which this feeds is obviously when we talk about why is migration, so this connects to the discussion that we've been having, for example, why is migration uh, problematized in the public sphere? And when we go and dig deeper, we realize that it's actually not any migrant that is problematic. It's only migrants from particular backgrounds that perform particular op occupations that take a particular um, demand resources in a particular way and so on that are problem. So I think there are huge First of all, uh, first of all, um, gaps and differences between migrants themselves in their class background and in a way in which they perceive them. So I am a migrant in the United Kingdom. People don't worry about me when they talk about migrants. They worry about a very different kind of migrant. And the reason these grievances are there have to do with the difference in distribution of national resources, but also with historical differences that have to do with the legacy of colonialism, with the um, extractive liberalism that uh, took place in a number of these contexts. So I think we see that global issues of asymmetries of distribution of power and resources affect the way in which then distributive conflicts are raised in the domestic sphere and that the asymmetries of power and resources, globally speaking, are then really important when we talk about the particular conflicts that we face in advanced liberal democracies. I have one last question. Um, and the question is from Ian Beck. He says, it is certainly true that migration was a factor in the Brexit decision. But to view it as an illustration of tribes misses the much more complex and nuanced influences behind the two sides. I think that refers to something Rudolf Stichway said, but maybe you want, want uh, to answer because I think you made the point that migration was a, was, a, was a main driver or a big driver in this discussion during the Brexit decision. As much as I understand it, was the Brexit decision was, and the Brexit process was very much accompanied by a kind of tribal split in the United Kingdom between, uh, say, uh, the big cities, especially London, but the other British cities too, and the relatively privileged economic situation which dominates in the cities and the well-educated liberal elites which live in the British cities and other regions of the United Kingdom, especially easily to be observed in the British North, which do not live in the big cities who are in much less privileged economic situations and who feel much, less in, much more endangered by migrants uh, in, because they think that migrants endanger their economic situation. And it's, I think the Brexit decision was motivated by, the, by, by an enormous tribal split arising in the UK, interestingly not mirrored in difference to the US by the British party situation, because all the big parties were against Brexit. It was a populist victory against the parties. It was not it, completely different from the Trump situation, uh, but it's, it's very much a tribal, very much a polarized and very much a continuing situation. And of course, it will continue uh, 
because the, 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 when Brexit has happened and now it happens, situation will become more bad and not better. The, the, the persons who voted for Brexit will be the losers of Brexit and that's a real tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> So unfortunately, our time is over now. Um, thanks everybody for this really interesting and vivid discussion. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, thanks to Andrea Römmele, Lea Uppi and Rudolf Stichwe, sorry, for this discussion. And yeah, I hope we can continue this discussion one day. And I, con I think this topic will, will stay with us uh, for the next month. So, I hope you're happy to see you again. Thanks, Thanks and goodbye. All. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.